it usually starts, now it depends on the size of the company, right? But uh, it usually will start by sitting down with the founder of the company. And I, I do an extensive interview. This is where I tap into the old journalism skills, right? And do an extensive interview and asking a lot of questions about their journey and how did they get to this place of launching this company? What was the route? And I go all the way back to childhood. Talk to me about your childhood. Talk to me about what happened there. It feels a little bit like a psychoanalysis, but what happens in the result, the result of doing this is that people start to see that none of this was by chance. None of this was by coincidence. And there is always a, an alignment of circumstances or events that have happened in their life that led them to where they are now. Welcome to the Small Business Safari, where I help guide you to avoid those traps, pitfalls, and dangers that lurk when navigating the wild world of small business ownership. I'll share those gold nuggets of information and invite guests to help accelerate your ascent to that mountaintop of success. It's a jungle out there, and I want to help you traverse through the levels of owning your own business that can get you bogged down and distract you from hitting your own personal and professional goals. So strap in, adventure team, and let's take a ride through the safari and get you to the mountaintop. And a one, two, three. Welcome back, everybody, to the Small Business Safari. We are going to rock another great episode. This is going to be one that's near and dear to both of Alan and my heart, uh, talking about marketing and helping you with your marketing strategies. I'm really excited to have Stephanie from Sizzle Marketing. Sizzle Force. Sizzle Force. Right? It's, Not such, just, a, it's such a cool name. I know, right? You just want to go, Sizzle Force. I mean, I just want to Sizzle Force through my marketing. But Stephanie, uh, I won't go through your bio. I've read your bio a little bit, but just tell us a little bit about where the hell you're from and what you do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I am from San Diego, California, and I started in marketing in 1995, got a degree in journalism in college, and then in 1995 started working in the newspaper industry because dot com didn't exist at the time. And uh, then, you know, it wasn't too long after that, that uh, the internet became a thing and websites started popping up for normal people outside of the government and uh, got all involved in that. And here we are, it's 2023 and I'm still in marketing. There you go. How about that? She finally, she's, she's like the only person I've ever met who's actually stayed in the same industry. <laughs> that is way. true. That's and impressive. Definitely, definitely not a guy like me, but before we get started, San Diego, which only varies like what two degrees a year, yeah, I don't like that. Year. So <laughs> we're coming from Atlanta, but you know what we forgot to do? Cheers! We forgot to say cheers. So Stephanie, today we're going to have a little glass of Whistle Pig Rye Whiskey. That's right. And while we talk with you and talk a little bit more about marketing and what have you there, so you started in the newspaper business, and I just this got to be fascinating at the time because that's all we knew. You know, a lot of people. Even us, as we get older, I think we forgot what it was like not to have the internet. Right. But the newspaper, that was it. The newspaper and the radio, and then, of course, the four channels we had on TV. <laughs> God forbid the president was on. Yeah, because <laughs> you didn't get to watch anything. That's right. So what was the most fun about getting into the newspaper business? And did you have this glamorous movie star view of it uh, before you got into the, doing papers? Yeah, I did. I definitely did. You know, I mean, we, we've all seen how Hollywood portrays the newsroom, right? And, you know, it's bustling and hustling and all the breaking news and all the all the juicy stuff happens in the newsroom. And so that definitely was my perception. I ended up not working in the newsroom, though. I ended up working in the advertising department, uh, writing instead of writing news stories. I was writing advertisements for clients. Oh, really? All right. So you yeah. were actually doing the advertising writing, uh, you know. Alan, just to do a quick aside, I did my first radio spot and it's playing, uh, has been for the last two weeks on WSB here, which is our local seven. No kidding. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. So oh, I went wow. in there to see how this goes. So they wrote my 30 second copy and then I, of course, had to tweak it. Uh, but I went in to do that. And, and I would tell you what, it's as cool and romantic as I thought it was going to be. Got into the studio, got the headphones on, got it all going. So you're writing, you're trying to come up with all these really cool words. What was the, what was the best, most what was the best one you ever did or the one that lasted the longest? 
You know what? One of my favorites. <laughs> this happened right, right, literally right when the internet started to become a thing. I I wrote uh, an ad that went in a magazine that said surf San Diego without getting wet. Oh, that's nice. Oh, was, come on. And I was like, oh, I'm so cute. <laughs> <laughs> She was sizzling that, before she was sizzling. That was my favorite. I love that one. Surf San Diego without because we it. used to say that. I mean, it sounds so antiquated now. Surf the web, you know. But but back then, that was like the coolest thing ever. So yeah, nice. That's that's awesome. All right, so we did talk about the sizzle and the marketing. Uh, you you actually have a passion towards telling a story, and I, that has to be coming from your newspaper background is that you still see that stories win. Let's talk about that one a little bit more. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you, you told stories then, and when you jumped into digital marketing, did you leave the storytelling behind because you figured you had to get into this new world and it, it was all different? No, not at all. Well, no, then. I brought the storytelling with me. I've always been a storyteller, always, and a story writer. Okay, So I got you know trained in school to do it. And uh, just it has it's a passion it's part of how i'm my dna i think uh i think everybody has a really really interesting story and we live in a world filled with all kinds of circumstances that create really fascinating stories and i love telling them so whether whatever medium i'm using it's kind of doesn't really matter right it doesn't matter if i'm telling the story through an ad or in the newspaper, or I'm telling the story. I wrote, you're talking about radio spots. I wrote so many radio spots. Uh, so, you know, sometimes telling a story that way, sometimes telling a story on a website, sometimes telling a story in a Facebook ad, right? There's so many different ways. And storytelling is the oldest form of communication. And I think the reason why, I mean, if you go back to the caveman days, right? If we go into the old caveman day caves, <laughs> we're going to find a bunch of hieroglyphics and basically stories painted on the walls, right? And well, yeah, Ellen, Ellen talks a lot about how he used to uh, draw. draw the <laughs> yeah. I was also I mean, going to say, Chris just got back from Vegas. So I, I imagine you added a few stories. To... Oh, I, I've definitely got some stories. Yeah. I'm not going to go on this. Case, so I, but... on your uh, on your bio, you talk about humanizing commerce. Is that what you're talking about with the stories? Yeah, because a lot of times, you know, especially the way it was when I started my career, there was a very, very uh, firm line between business and pleasure. Right. And it was the way that it was expected to be business. Business was over on the left side. Pleasure or personal was over here on the right side. And the two did not commingle at all. Right. Well, when when the world started to adopt this new way of looking, finding things online and whatnot, there started to be um, message boards, if you remember those. OK message boards like Yahoo message boards. And all of a sudden people started to be real in a public environment. Okay. And um, I think it started, that was the beginning of really creating an authentic uh, stage, if you want to say. And awesome. so, yeah. That, that, that's the gold nugget right there. And she talked about that. And so Alan and I, both corporate America refugees in, in the corporate world, and absolutely, there was a very strong line between business and personal. I did not invite friends over uh, to go out. I didn't socialize with uh, necessarily wives and spouses. That's just not the way we did it. It was business, and then we did that. Now, occasionally, would we? You bet, but not. In, and now, today, especially in the digital world, um, being authentic out there and being yourself, I've been coached to do that, right? Chris, you got to be yourself. I'm like, I don't think you know who I am, buddy. <laughs> well, and even, uh, and but, don't you think like big companies almost take on a personality because people want to know about the company and how it was founded and what's their level of civic involvement? What causes do they stand for? And it's just part of this overall personality that's being created for a company. Yeah, absolutely. And most big companies have invested millions and millions of dollars into creating their persona. And is that something that you help them do? Sure is. <laughs> All right. Well, tell us a story. Yeah. <laughs> tell us a story, funny lady. <laughs> <laughs> tell you a story. Let's see. 
I'm trying to think of what story I could share with you. You want to give me another, another little prompt here? All right, I'll give you a prompt. So what I meant was, um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 we again know that you've worked with Starbucks. You've worked with a lot of the Fortune 500 companies and helped them craft a story. Talk about how you came in and maybe helped them uh, go, listen, guys, you, right now you're bland, but if you tell this story, it's going to help you. It usually starts, now it depends on the size of the company, right? But uh, it usually will start by sitting down with the founder of the company. And I, I do an extensive interview. This is where I tap into the old journalism skills, right? And do an extensive interview and asking a lot of questions about their journey and how did they get to this place of launching this company? What was the route? And I go all the way back to childhood. Talk to me about your childhood. Talk to me about what happened there. It feels a little bit like a psychoanalysis, but what happens in the result, the result of doing this is that people start to see that none of this was by chance. None of this was by coincidence. And there is always a, an alignment of circumstances or events that have happened in their life that led them to where they are now. Did and you make, have you ever made anybody cry in the process? The time. <laughs> are you all serious? Time. Yeah, I, big guys, big, tough men cry like babies when they read their story because they're like, how did I not see that? Let I it out, know. Chris. I go down bad. I, I know. <laughs> I got a feeling right now. I, I felt like, you know, that'd be the thing when she walk in. I'm like, all right, you're not going to make me cry like that. Harvey Firestone, the guy who used to do these uh, touch, uh, touchy feely uh, sports interviews. They're like, all right, you're not going to make me cry. <laughs> well, I can, but I can imagine she comes in and some people are like, oh, come on, really? I just, I just want the uh, catchy jingle. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> and next thing you know, they're putting up with your questions. And then next thing you know, they're calling their therapist and crying on the couch. Yeah. Well, I don't leave them in a sad place. That's the, that's the difference. Okay. So it's going to okay, make good. me, I'm going to sound like I'm not a nice person, but I actually am a really nice person, but I know I've done my job well when I write a story and my client cries. So my goal is to make you cry. Right. Well, because you know, honestly, uh, yes, you're right. And you're not, you're not a bad person for making us cry. I, I, I've been through a lot of therapy to learn <laughs> that, by the way. Please, I have. Gotten in touch with yourself, Chris. I've, I'm proud of I've you. learned. Yeah. Well, you know what happens? What that means is you've actually revealed some truth and some meaning and some depth and something that actually matters. Bingo. Talk about that. And how about making a connection with a customer by telling your story of how your company started and why you started it and where you came from? I mean, like you said, you went all the way back to childhood. Mm -hmm. um, which is which is how I ended up starting my business. I was in banking of all things, and I grew up just working on houses for funsies. That was our vacations when I was a kid. And here I am now in home repair and remodeling here in Atlanta. But um, I, you know, here's a question for you: When you talk to these people, um, sometimes we're not in the best headspace at the time. You know, are we having a lot of fun right now running our businesses? I just wonder. I think a lot of people probably are not. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about the history, how you started it. Do you see a little glimmer in their eye on how they kind of bootstrapped and made it happen and went through those hard times and got to where they are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so absolutely. You know, it reignites the dream, kind of reignites the vision, uh, gets them back into a place where they're like, oh, yeah, this is why I'm doing it. Oh, yeah, this is what I'm called to do. Oh, my gosh, I have a purpose. I'm all back in. <laughs> see, And I'm happy again. Right. Yeah. See, she, she brought me back. Now I'm happy. I'm crying tears of joy. So when, when you first started doing this, my guess is, is you were way ahead of the curve and people are like, what, what are you doing? And, yeah. and, and now what you're doing is maybe more, more mainstream. I like to say that I was authentic before being authentic was cool. Yeah. So, now authentic is almost a word that's getting overused, isn't it? It is overused, you know, but I was, you know, I was humanizing commerce long before it was a trendy thing to do. And honestly, long before it was even acceptable in the workplace. I was going to say, hang on. So I agree. She definitely was a ground bla uh, blazer on this, but let's think ground about blazer, that. Is that an, that's an, you just coined a new word. Yeah, Why? Well, that's what I do. Brown <laughs> yeah. blazer. Um, and that's what I do. I I'm, I'm ahead of my time as well. I could make up words that nobody <laughs> even understands. But had you tried to be authentic, you know, what, 25 years ago, internet's still coming out. And next thing you know, you know, things are flashing across the internet that you don't want to be flashing or you're exposing yourself more than you're supposed to. And I'm mm -hmm. not talking about it, not talking about flashing. Not, not Vegas, right. Chris. Right. Yeah. But I mean, it had to be hard. I mean, we were pushing that envelope with customers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons that I went out on my own, right? Because there, there's only so much that you could do in corporate America 
in the way that it was and what was uh, allowed, permissible, you know, deemed appropriate, if you want to say. And yeah. uh, that was one of the reasons that I went out on my own was because I was like, you know what, there's more here that's not being talked about. And um, we need to be sharing these stories. It's important. You know, and, and today, I think about where things are today. We are more in a stage of conscious consumerism than ever before. People spend money with the companies that align with their values. Okay. So it, it's not, you know, it used to be, you know, you want to go buy cookies, you're going to go to the store, you're going to buy a package of cookies. There are a lot of people now that will only buy cookies from this brand because this brand represents what they believe in. And if it's that brand that represents what they don't believe in, they will not buy those cookies. It's almost like politics now. And it is like I, politics. people are going to just start <laughs> stumbling over themselves with this. I've been watching this a little bit too. And, you know, you're starting to see, you know, Hollywood, you've got actors who are very open about their politics. And then you yeah. wonder, okay, is this going to start leading to people not going to see this person's movies, but they're only going to go see that person's movies. And yeah. it's, it's going to be an interesting thing to watch, I think. Well, you can even think about like what's happening with Twitter now. Okay. The Elon Musk, you either love him or you hate him. There's not very many middle of the road people, you know, he, he's, he's got a strong personality. Okay. So one guy owns Twitter and there's all these people on it. Elon Musk comes in with his political opinions and a bunch of people leave Twitter and a bunch of advertisers leave Twitter, right? It's just a, it's a social media platform. Like what in the world? Why are people making these decisions? But it's because it's the stage that we're in right now as humans. Conscious consumerism is a thing. And it's a matter of how you spend your money, how you spend your time, who you associate with. And it goes on and on and on. Well, you guys are taking me down a deep path because there was a question I want to ask her in the beginning and I'm going to go back to it. So I'm just going to do it. <laughs> a lot of times we talk about you got to tell a story, but a lot of people still don't know how to. What are the good elements of a story? If 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 I'm a person listening to this podcast and we've got a number of them who a uh, small business is trying to scale, wh what is a good story? Maybe I'm not the best storyteller. How do I tell a story? That's a good question, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> That's actually an excellent question. So I'm I'm actually certified with a company called Story Brand. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I will tell you that the creator of Story Brand, Donald Miller has deduced how to tell a great story better than anybody else that I know. And so I'm going to His share books are amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually going to share his formula with you. Um, and I just want to make sure that I have this. Have you right ever read any of his so, books? Um, I, didn't, I didn't make it all the way through. <laughs> Blue Like Jazz? I know. I didn't watch. I didn't read that one. Uh, uh, I forget which one I started and I didn't. I, I, a great story. Don't get me wrong. I just ADD. Yeah, you are. All right, so, I'm ready. Here's how it works, right? Uh, there is a character in every story and this character has a problem. Now it might be, you know, a real life threatening problem or it might just be an inconvenience. Nonetheless, it's a problem, whatever magnitude of a problem it is, okay? So this person is feeling a certain way because of this problem. It's impacting their life. And there are things that happen um, in their conversations with their trusted confidants, okay, there are things that are said in, you know, thoughts that go through their mind late at night when their head is on the pillow. And then there are the things that they say to people about this problem, people that they don't necessarily have that level of trust with, okay? And then there's a philosophical belief about why it's wrong to have this problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. I'm 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 still I'm I'm tracking. Okay. So, um so then this character ends up meeting a guide. And the guide is typically the company that is going to work with this person that has this problem, okay? The guide is going to present them to the solution they're looking for. So you want to introduce next who the guide is, why they can be trusted, and um, build up their credibility. And then you want to get into the next part of... So Chris, it's kind of like Luke Skywalker meets Yoda is where 100%. we are. 
sense. Oh, now you're talking my language. Okay, I just want okay. to, I knew you said you were tracking, but I knew you weren't. Right. There we go. Okay. Okay. Go I ahead, do. Stephanie. That's actually an example they talk about in the story brand book. Oh. So, um, so the guide, it, their credibility is proved, right? But they also express empathy, right? So in a great story, the guide is always going to be empathetic toward the problem the character has. Then the guide is going to create a plan to solve their problem, okay? Um, then they are going to call them to action, okay? So th these are the steps you need to take to solve your problem, and this is the action that you need to take. Okay, click this button, buy this product, whatever it might be. Um, then they paint the picture of what it's going to look like on the other side. You're going to avoid these failures and you're going to experience these successes. And those I'm are already, the elements of a great story. I'm already coming up with the next one for I'm going to call ourselves the fairy handyman. <laughs> I think I think we need to work that through a little oh, shit. bit. All right. All right. No, that uh well said. That was an a, a, well, I don't know because I didn't read Donald Miller's book, but I will. Um, and if you want to give us an introduction to him, we'll have him on too. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, but uh, no, that I think that's well done. So then for those listening and for me, I'm picking that up as well. This is different than the way you thought maybe a story was supposed to be said, because this is not kindergarten, how to tell a story. This is how to tell a story in today's world. And there's a lot of things that you can follow there on what you want to put out there on your personal brand, on whether it be LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, whatever you're doing it on Twitter, but that telling that story consistently like that uh, will eventually pay off. And uh, and I think that's great. That's great stuff. I just love that stuff. Yeah. Well, and if you look at it, I mean, honestly, I dare you guys to try and read a book, watch a television show, see a movie, go to a play, whatever, and tell me if you ever see something again where there's not a character with a problem that expresses how they feel about the problem, who meets a guide that gives them a plan <laughs> to action, and then they live happily ever after. And then it's two photon torpedoes down the tube and the Death Star blows up. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Luke. And Yoda says, do. <laughs> so that's awesome. You, you know, you know, I was actually running through this in my head. I'm like, I'm going to find one. I'm going to find one. No, you're not. I, you, all right, stop. Let's get back to the podcast. Okay. Thank you. Are, are you with so, us? Uh, yeah. All right. So let's go to the uh, journey um of leaving corporate america which uh we have done mm -hmm. uh, and going out on your own did you have clients did you have a plan did, i mean did you say man this first year i'm going to just be set i'm going to be balling i'm going to be doing two hours a week of two hours a week of work and making three times as much as i wanted or did you really just go huh, i'm not sure what i'm about to do but i'm gonna go do this the latter is much, <laughs> much closer to my story. <laughs> no, I did not take clients with me. I didn't do any of that. No, um, I actually was craving something quite different. So, you know, I really enjoyed my corporate career. I learned a lot. It was got great experience. That was cool. Um, but when it was time to go, it was time to go. And it was time to uh, peel a different orange, so to speak, and start something new and find something new and yummy and juicy inside, right? So cool. that's what I did. So when did you land your first client? When did I land them? Yes. It was pretty quick thereafter because I was hungry. <laughs> I was hungry. I was newly married. Isn't and that motivating? Yeah. Hunger hunger is a good uh, motivator for sure. I was hungry. I, I you know, kind of wired to be... Uh, a hunter, if you want to say. Um, I love to win, a little competitive, maybe a lot competitive, All right. others, but also with myself. So for me, it was like, okay, I'm hungry. Um, I don't like being hungry. I better do something really fast. And so I started smiling and dialing and there you go. Love it. We're, as, well, I've got two questions, but the first one just in this thread was, were your first clients kind of rebels because you're, you're heading down a different path than a traditional marketing firm? My first clients were actually nonprofit Christian organizations. So it yes, was the answer was yes. Then yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> yes. So, uh, I specifically went into a niche where I knew the stories were going to be really heartfelt and the stories were going to be really transformational. 
and really authentic. And they were um, much more willing to to try this. So you honed your craft, but based on what I know about nonprofit organizations, they don't have the ability to pay well. So there had to be a... You would be surprised. Really? Well, it depends on the size of the organization. (laughs) Nice. You know, so I, she might be saying God provides. In well, ways. <laughs> so that may dovetail into my next question, which is, okay, you just told us how, what uh, the components of a good story are, and there's a guide. Who was your guide? Wow. That's a great question. I can't believe no one's asked me that before, but I don't think anybody has. Let's go. All right. <laughs> all right. He gets one. We got all the good questions today. Well, we're still tied. One no, one Chris one. had one. I, we're one, one, one and one. Yes. All right. So who's your guide? I don't know. Oh I think God. I broke Stephanie. <laughs> you might have broken me. You really you might have. I'm like, who wants my guide? I felt like I just figured this all out if I went. You know, I don't think I had a guide. I don't need no stinking guide. You know what? I am your guide, Alan. <laughs> That's what you should have said. Alan, I am your guide. Hey, I'm here to make you. All right. Well, me. I'll ask a different question, Stephanie. Right. Um, could you have written a longer book title? <laughs> Well, come on, that's not super nice. <laughs> that I think we just unveiled a little bit about a character that we have. And there's a problem over here to my if you know what I mean. Well, okay, so you do need to understand that there are uh, two people in published authors and uh they're not me. That's so right. I t- I tend to take it every time we start talking so about he, books. All right. So to be honest, Stephanie, it's not you. It was me. I'm the mean one. And I'm the one who always picks on him for not writing a book. <laughs> so he was trying to throw the first salvo, <laughs> figuring I would come to your defense, which I'm about to. And like, listen, buddy, it ain't about the title, about what's behind there, right? And the fact that she's a published author, suck it. She's an international <laughs> bestseller, Chris. How many? How many? Uh, well, I am international. Okay. Uh, I do know that. The books have been sold internationally because uh, something had to get translated, which is cool. That is cool. Right. What language? Uh, Spanish. Nice. Uh, Right. But bestseller, uh, if it's a category of From the Zoo to the Wild, uh, Your Guide to Entrepreneurial Freedom and Wealth, I am definitely in first place. That's the category. Okay. You guys want to know a little marketing secret? Yeah. Yeah. There's a reason behind the long title. Yeah. It's not just because I like words. The reason is uh, keyword optimization. You optimize your title to have certain keywords that the target market is looking for, and they're going to find your book when they're looking on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatever. See, Stephanie, it was not a mean question by me. It was a <laughs> setup for you to be, show your awesomeness. Yeah. Yeah. So you <laughs> might really? notice. <laughs> wow. You, you are, you are smarter than I ever thought. Uh, and I've known you for a long time. I've got my days. No, that was good. I took a so, pill. All right. So let's talk about the book a little bit. When did you write it? Why did you write it? Uh, tell everybody a little bit about it, and then, then we'll plug it. Of course, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, because we're going to keyword optimize the heck out of this too. Excellent. There I are a lot of keywords in that title. Just there like, are. Yeah, there are a lot of keywords. She's so works. much smarter than you, Chris. Oh, I, 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 trust me, I, I know that. <laughs> I published the book in 2018. I wrote it. Uh, well, you know, as a writer it's something I always dreamed of doing of writing my own book. So I wrote it because it was a dream and I wanted to do it. I didn't want it to, you know, my dream to die in the grave with me. And um, what was your other question? So uh, a little bit more about the why, what yeah, you, you wanted to write a book, but so why this book and what's in it that people should get out of it? Yeah. I wanted to write something that, showed people how they can create a heart-centered brand that stands out in a noisy world, okay? It goes back to storytelling, the heart-centeredness. I just feel like there's there's just been this gap in in the world for so long about like, where's the heart, you know? It's so much about commerce. Where's the heart? People are driven by emotions. People make purchasing decisions based on emotions. A lot of people say, no, I don't. I make all my decisions based on logic. Yeah, right. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Um, You you don't. People just don't. And we know that. And so I'm like, if we can get more heart into commerce, it will serve so many greater purposes, right? It will give so much more meaning to things, but it will truly lead to transformation. It will it, it will do all the good things. And so I wanted to show people, well, how do you create a heart-centered brand? What does it look like? And one that isn't just heart-centered and all fluffy and gooey, 
but something that actually makes your company stand out because the marketplace is so noisy. It is so, so noisy. All of us are seeing and hearing thousands of messages every day. Our brains can only retain so much information. So when how we, does a company say something that people are not going to forget? And we spend so much of our time now avoiding ads. Exactly. And, and, yeah. And so to, to, to make it stand out, I mean, it has to be powerful and quick. Yeah. I think one of the things I'm going to have my uh, sales guys do when we go do estimates, I'm going to have them bring pictures of them and their dog. Even if they don't have one, I'm going to have them pose with it <laughs> and say, Just go rent buy a with dog. Me? Yeah. Wouldn't you buy for me? I have a cute dog. Uh, <laughs> That's not it. That's not it. No, sorry. And that's not authentic either. That's a fake shallow dog story. With a fake dog. Chris. Shallow, shallow you, need better, fake. You, need, you need a better guide. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, well, we just, we found out who I am. Yeah. Shallow and fake. Yeah. 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 Well, that's your story. Uh, that, hey, and you got to go back one. to Vegas. And, <laughs> all right. I, I have a question, another question for you, Stephanie. So <laughs> one of the things uh, that you do, it, there's the number one mistakes that, uh, number one mistake that entrepreneurs make mm -hmm. i have a guess mm -hmm. this is the number one mistake entrepreneurs make when marketing their small business is that what is that what it is i want to know because oh. i'm pretty sure i did it and i still continue number one to mistake, the number one mistake small business owners make is that they jump into what we call tactical implementation before developing their strategy <laughs> okay so they uh they say, great, I'm in business. I'm going to get a website. I'm going to get a business card. I'm going to, you know, put all my social media profiles up there. And then they have no strategy behind it. They have no clarity about who their ideal client is. They have no clarity about what they really care about that, that motivates them to make purchases. They don't have their message clear. So they start populating the internet and all of their other marketing materials with information that is just kind of haphazard and it's like throwing spaghetti against the wall and it doesn't work. It doesn't move anything. People don't end up buying. They don't meet their goals. Then they get all frustrated and say, it doesn't work. And the fact is it does work. It's you didn't have your strategy planned out before you jumped into the tactics. I love that. So don't jump right into the tactics. Make sure you have a strategy. Um, I, I felt like, you know, I did that, you know, talking about getting my avatars because that was the thing I did uh, to make sure that I knew who my target market was. And I can't tell you how many handymen that I've met now uh, throughout the nation. And they're single man shops. You know, we, we got 40 people in my company, but a lot of these guys are smaller, one, two, three people shops. No strategy, no idea. And the same thing. They're like, well, I was told I got to have a, uh, a web page and I got my business card. And hey, what do you think about my wrap and my logo? And of yeah. course, number one. It's a it's a crazy logo. It's got a million things on it. Uh, they don't really know who they're going to because they're just going to go to whoever gives them business. Um, and they're just not thinking through their strategy on, on who they really want to work for. And, and that's where we have to go figure out who does, we're trying to work for. Does that back into just not taking enough time with your business plan? Yeah, I think a business plan is kind of old school. I think. Well, it, look at who you're talking to, Stephanie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She yeah. clearly didn't read my book. Yeah, our, yeah. our podcast is a zoo to the wild, old school. It is right. old school. Yeah. And we are old. I don't know if you can't see this, uh, but we'll be on YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of gray hair on one side of this. But just because we're old doesn't mean we don't know what we're talking about. And I mean, don't you think, you know, blocking and tackling the basics of a business plan are still valid today, regardless of what's going on in the world? Don't you think? Did we lose her? She froze. I think you broke Stephanie. I broke Stephanie again. Well, wait a minute, Alan. Let me jump in because I have to do this. All right. So uh, Alan wants to talk business plan, but I want to just talk about this. I think if you jump in and just start doing all that stuff that those handymen are doing, web page, this and that, it's just a great way to lose a lot of money because you're going to let somebody take a lot of money from you and spend a lot of money that you didn't have. So when you talk about having a good strategy, what are the components that we should be thinking about before we do this, before we embark on it? One of the most important things is to identify how your company is different from every other company that offers a similar product or service. Okay. So if you have a bunch of handyman companies out there, well, you know, who can help me fix my garage door? Everybody. Well, what makes you better at fixing garage doors than the next guy? Uh, I don't know. I'm cheaper. That's what most people do. 
they go to the price wars, right? Well, here's the thing. I mean, we live in a a global marketplace now. There's always someone who's going to work for less than you, always. So you're going down a slippery slope when you play that game, real slippery slope. It can lead you, uh, it can lead you to poverty if you're not careful. So I always tell people, figure out how you're different and don't make it your price, right? Figure out how you're truly different and better than your competition and start articulating that. And so that's why you have a dog. And that's, that's why I'm going to go get my fake dog and put him in. No, (laughs) uh, so here, here's the thing. It's uh, just to timestamp. This is the beginning of the year 23. I take uh, a lot of my leadership and we do a strategic offsite meeting. And one of our breakout sessions is exactly that. How do we go out there and market our unique better than we are today based on the survey, the information I'm going to give them? That's one of the breakout sessions. You're, you're, you're so 2023. Chris. Dude, I'm, I'm feeling so cool. Right? In fact, I'm, you know, she's validated me. She completes me. <laughs> Thank you. She's your guide Here, now. Here's right? something that's really important to make sure that people do. A lot of times when I say, well, how are you different from your competition to one of our clients? They might say something that's very um, touchy feely. We really care. Yes. Okay. And you better, you're in business. That is not a differentiator. That is not a differentiator. Give me something quantifiable. Give me something that I can be proven with fact. Okay. That is a differentiator. That's a good one. And sometimes though, don't you get into some industries where it's hard to come up with that differentiator? Is that where, you know, your magic skills come in? That's why they hire me. Did That's you see why the twinkle they in her eye? The big bucks. Just, just for the <laughs> listeners, there was a big twinkle. I yeah. love that. Great yeah. stuff, Alan. <laughs> all right. So you work with companies of all sizes, I imagine, and, and different marketing budgets. Clearly, yeah. if I'm a if I'm a newer person just starting out, um, and let's I guess newer starting out is probably relative. Let's say they're in it for a couple of years, and they finally they're they're looking at doing even more marketing. How much should they expect to spend a year? Depends how quickly you want to grow, right? Depends how aggressive you want to be out in the marketplace. I mean, I have seen, you know, some very small companies say, I'm a small business, but I got big dreams and I don't have a lot of time to waste. So I'm going to go and hit it hard. And they might invest 30% of their gross revenue, right? That's a huge chunk, but they might do that because they want to be aggressive. You know, then there's much more conservative companies that will say, oh, we're going to give 5%. If you're giving less than 5% of your gross revenue, you're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. So they always say that uh, 50% of your marketing budget is wasted. You just don't know which 50%. And so Mm -hmm. it's tough when you're a small business owner and you know, um, okay, they're telling me to spend more money, but I, I just, I, I'm not comfortable with this amount of money. How how do I know this is going to, I mean, what would you say to somebody to make them feel better about upping their budget like that? Mm, well, I think if you're working with the right marketing expert, they're going to have the case studies that show they know what they're doing. Oh, see, there's a good one. So I think, you know, that confidence to invest more comes from working with someone that you trust and that trust is built by experience and the marketer saying, well, this is what I did for so-and-so and -and so-and-so. So So if I can do it for them, why can't I do it for you? Right now, the, another mistake people often make when they're early in their business is, Oh, you know, my 17 year old nephew uh, he's on that TikTok thing all the time. <laughs> right. I'm going to have him do our TikToks and manage our social media. Okay. Now I'm speaking right now as a mother of three teenagers. Okay. Uh, 15, 18, well now just turned 20. Okay. You, by so, the way, I, we, we see your office. Your kids are not allowed in your office. I can there, see that right no now. Way. There is no <laughs> it's way. So clean. You just said, you just said three boys. I had two boys and a daughter. Okay. Yeah. And there's no way they're not allowed. The there. pictures are all, right. all straight. Everybody. I know. All right. So, all right. So 19 just turned 20, 15. And how old was the other one? 18. Oh, boy. Okay. So here's what I can tell you. My oh, kids are on social media all the time. Yeah. Right. Do they know how to market a business on social media? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Especially not. And I would be 
so foolish if I said, hey, sweetie, come here. Hey, I need you to uh, do something on TikTok for me. They'd be like, cool. And they would do something from the vantage point of a teenage brain, which as we all know, is not fully developed <laughs> and it shows, right? Love you kids, love you so much, but no, you cannot run my business marketing. Yes, I identify as a teenage brain. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. You saw that look on my face. He's looking at me and I'm like, yes. You still true. have a teenage brain. That's the I, only thing. I do. That's the only thing I've got. <clears throat> yes, I'm just in the body of a really I, old man. I have one more question because I know we're running out of time. All right, yeah, keep going. So you talk about how to make your website a conversion machine. Mm -hmm. And I've been part of organizations where, okay, we're, we're getting the hits and then we see where they're landing on the page and they're spending a certain amount of time on the page and we just can't get them to, to convert. Mm -hmm. So what, what can you bring to the table on that? Please be my guide. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. right. You need to be Yoda. Be Yoda right now, Stephanie. Right. Okay. Well, one thing that a lot of people forget, it's pretty simple, is they forget to tell people what they want them to do. Right. They just assume that people are gonna, you know, they're gonna write something on a website page and and people are gonna read it and then call them or book an appointment or click the buy now button, but they don't actually tell them to do it. They just passively leave. Uh, their phone number up in the right-hand corner of the website. If you want people to call you and make an appointment, you need to tell them to do that, right? Because most people are followers and most people are looking for a leader. And certainly if they're looking to do business with you, they want you to be the expert and show them the way. So that's one thing is making sure that you have very clear calls to action. Uh, I'm a big believer in like on a homepage specifically, having at least five call to action buttons. On the homepage? Uh-huh, on the homepage alone. How many do you have, Chris? Uh, um, um, <laughs> um, no, I have two. Yeah, I just, I was- I, I really I, have two? I do have two, uh, but man, uh, five? Dude, hey, I want a website conversion machine, baby, and I'm gonna go do it. <laughs> you're, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, you're only 40% of optimal. You know, it's funny is that people say when I walk around, my buttons are out there for everybody to push. But I didn't think it was I, my website. I, you're right. I need to have my website with a lot of buttons to push. I you think need to say something that matters, right? At the, yeah, very Chris. Top, at the very, very top of your website, before anybody scrolls and, you know, goes to another page or whatnot, you absolutely need to have a statement at the very top of your website that captivates them, catches that their attention, and then makes them want to know more. Well said. I, I uh, actually, that's one thing about my website that I've directed my guys over the last 14 years is that, look, you know, I'm a, I'm a goldfish. In fact, I'm not even goldfish in tension span. I'm actually deficit on that. And I said, I've got to have everything above the line. I've got to have above the fold. And these guys in the beginning, lots of graphics want to do, especially in the beginning of the load times. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. We, I got to have something short and sweet on why you want to call me and have me help you with your stuff at your house. Yep. Yep. That's a great point. I see lots of those call to action buttons though, and I'm afraid to click them because I just feel like I'm going to get sucked into this funnel of pain. I mean, is there, um, a... I'll give you a great well, that's one. That's the whole point. We want you to get sucked in the funnel. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so you got sucked in the vortex back to our Star Wars thing. Um, I'm going to finish with this because, you know, Angie's, uh, which now has home advisor, Angie's list, and, and they bought a couple other companies. I went out there just to do a little secret shopping. Do you know how many flipping screens I had to go through just to get somebody uh, so I could see the list of providers? In fact, I stopped because I was at, at, the, at that point, I was at 12. I had gone through 12 screens before they would even show me. You're providers. holding up seven fingers. Well, no, I, I, I mean, but that was, I mean, there, there's no way. I, so for me, when you go to my website, it's click, fill out a form and you're out of here. Three screens and you're gone. You want to make uh, and, it super fast and super easy. The more complicated you make it, the more obstacles you put in people's way, the more likely they are not to take the desired action. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, gosh, that is the gold nugget right there, mm -hmm. everybody. You want to beat Angie's, uh, especially in the home services world, you make it easy. If you're not in that home services world and you want to make it easy, make it easy on that first homepage. Put it short, make it succinct. Do not bit this long, long list of reasons about why you got into business. They're not going to read it there. They want to know what they can do, what you can do to help them in their life. Mm -hmm. Wow, this has been awesome. It, it, 
so our fractional CMO has delivered a heart centered guide, and I now have the short story to download. But it is now not to read books. It's not all touchy feely. Five call to action buttons on one page. I'm I mean, doing it. That's hardcore. I'm doing it. You do eight. You know what? <laughs> you do better. I'm going to do right, better. You do better, Chris. As my daughter says. <laughs> do better, Dad. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Let's jump into the. Uh, well, before we do that, what? I just have a couple things I got to. No, I'm just going to go into this now. All right, let's go into the five questions. And then... Five questions? What? You said five. I know I was going to say, I'm going to add one on you. Because if you're going to add a question, then I'm going to add one. You already had three. Oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, Stephanie, you mentioned Donald Miller's book. But other than that, what is a good book that you would recommend to our audience? The Bible. Oh, oh, nice. You know what? She just (laughs) mic dropped. We can't ask that for anybody else. That is the good book. Yep. Nobody can top that. Nobody can top that. All right. Ready? All right. Next question. What's the favorite feature of your house? My kitchen. My Um, husband is an architect and my kitchen, the kitchen he designed for us is so beautiful. Tons of light, tons of windows, big space. I love it. What kind of grill? What kind of stove top do you have? I was asking the same thing. I know. I don't know. Oh, oh. <laughs> see, we're we're a bunch of cooks. We're yeah. we're actually a lot of foodies. So when you said the kitchen, I'm you big. had me a kitchen. As soon as she said K, I was like, oh, she's a kitchen. Do you have oh, a pot? Actually, do you have a pot so filler? My husband is actually the cook in the house too. Yeah. Oh, oh that's man. us. Yeah. Right. yeah. He's Alan a much better cook it. than I am. So he, he could tell you what our stove top was, but not me. Sorry. Beautiful. I love that you love that. That's great. All right. When you're out there uh in customer service land, because we are customer service. Freaks, we're gonna have to do that I, again. I, what, I just so swallow bad. The, they ride. Dude, this is come on, get get on the game. All right. Anyway, what is a customer service pet peeve of yours when you're out there getting served in the marketplace? Bone trees. Bone trees. Oh, nice one. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, press me. one if you want this, and then I press one, and then it says, "Sorry, we didn't hear you. Please try again." Or press here's if you want this. And I press it again. Sorry, there must be a connection issue. <laughs> Here's your five options, and none of them are close to what yes. you need. How, oh, yeah, it is so funny. Is that uh, so? I did. I actually implemented call centers years ago, and this is in the uh, late '90s. And uh, one time we implemented this call center, and it was for a very large bank in the nation. And one of the all the callers went into a queue that was not going to be answered because of the technology. <laughs> and this the here was the solution that came down. And I'm in this call center. And we're implementing it. I'm a consultant there. And they said, what you need to do is answer each call. Say, thank you for calling XXXX. Goodbye. Thank you for calling XXX. Goodbye. <laughs> and we had to do that for a hundred people. And we just would call them because they had to get out of the queue to get back in. Oh. But as we were designing this, one of the best call center ones that we all got to listen to, it was press seven to hear a duck quack. You press seven. <laughs> quack. I'm like, you know what? That's actually, and now after, after here we are 25 years later, I'm like, that's probably the best button ever. Right. That's the only call tree I want to listen to because the rest of you guys are just idiots. I would push the button to hear the duck clack. I would. Yeah. yeah that's a go. great answer, Stephanie. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. That's All a right. great one. All Thanks right. Number three, me. give us a DIY nightmare story. Mm, all right. I got a pretty recent one for you. Um, at one point, we remodeled our bathroom and um, did a, uh, made it from like a, what is it called? A half bath and do a full bath. And uh, about a month ago, my daughter was taking her shower and she said, mom, there's something growing in the shower, which is not something that any mother ever wants to hear. So I'm like, what in the world? And I go in there and there's a little sprout, a little sprout coming up through the drain. Um, Come to find out, uh, you know, a few plumbers later, they like pulled out roots that were like five feet deep from trees that were growing and literally sprouting in the shower. <laughs> so. Oh my God. That is, uh, you know, I actually, I knew that story, but, um, I've seen that. I've actually seen little mushrooms grow in showers too. Um, but that's another oh, story so for another day. Microgreens. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, it's because people, um, when, when you mix the mortar, if you use, uh, water from the outside and some, in the old school days, we used to use it and actually used uh, dirt and you bring the organic material in. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, it's a long time ago, but it's, uh, it still happens, but that one, yes. Uh, so you had to have your, your, your drains all cleaned. Did you have to have them lined or have to have them rerun? 
Well, we had to have them all cleaned, which we literally just did. And now we need to jackhammer our bathroom and remodel it again. Oh, I'm so sorry. I oh. hey, as long sad. as the kitchen's okay. No, that it, that kitchen, actually hurts me. Cool. That hurts my heart. That one hurts my heart. When I hear that, they just did the bathroom <laughs> and had to do it again. I've had to remodel two bathrooms of dreams for people over the years because the <laughs> dreams guys, that can be nightmares. It, well, because they completely did them wrong and we had to redo them all. And wow. it's you don't you don't want to pay it for that. That's the worst. Oh my gosh, Stephanie, great stories. You are the storyteller extraordinaire and guide for all of us. How can everybody get a hold of you? Yeah, you can go to my website, sizzleforce.com. Uh, I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. I've got kind of a scary last name, so maybe you can put it in the show notes, a link to link. Pronounce it for us, please. Navinskis. Navinskis. Just like it's spelled. Right, it, it is. is. It's phonetically correct. It's just it is. little letters, so it scares people. It does. It like your last you. name. You, did, you didn't use it. I know I didn't because I realized. <laughs> I know you said jumped... this is Stephanie. <laughs> and, I went, and I did. I choked on my tongue because I. He, here's the thing. It's he did just get me. back from Vegas. Well, yeah. And my last name is Lalomia. And I can't tell you how many times like I go on a podcast and they go, okay, I got it. All right. Hey, and here's Chris Lomomia. I'm like, <laughs> right. uh. I actually yeah. train all of my guys to never use, never ask the customer's last name uh, uh-huh. because the last thing you want to do is butcher that because everybody just looks at you, especially here in the South and goes, Oh, bless your heart. You don't yeah, know my name. Right. <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute. That has nothing to do with my skill set of helping you with your house. So I said, guys, just skip it. Just you use your first name. They'll introduce themselves back, call it good. And then we can work on the whole win friends and influences people later. There you I go. I wonder what the California version of bless your heart is. I mean, in New York, it's you're dead to me. That's true. Yeah. yeah, you know, it wasn't too long ago that I learned bless your heart actually wasn't a nice thing to say. You're right. I always thought it was a nice thing to say. And no. people out here will say bless your heart because we think it's like, oh, that sounds so lovely. And I learned it's actually quite snarky. And I was well, like, oh, no. It, it, can, it can be nice, but it isn't always. I mean, the South is full of landmines. That yeah. one, that then and, and, and they're all definitely landmines because they're underneath <laughs> really nice beaches because we're nice down here at least at least, at least to your face yeah, um, that's right. stephanie this has been amazing if you didn't pick something up from here that's on you because you guys have got to figure out how to best market your company keep going up that mountaintop of success because to do it right you got to be effective on how you're marketing what you're doing and getting your name out there because people don't know who the heck you are i just was part of a study and that study said unaided how many how many people will know your company know your company's name in your marketplace if you've been doing it for 15 years and the answer was 3 out of 10 can't can only name a company that they've heard on the radio but they can't name your company and can't even remember your company and i'm talking about personal injury lawyers i'm talking about banks i'm talking about electrical companies so you've got to get out there tell that heart centered story because you're trying to find your target market your avatar go make that happen I was on my stoke box because I was so excited about what Stephanie talked about today. Stephanie, <laughs> thank you so much. Adventure team, go out there, make it a great day. We're out of here. Thanks, Stephanie. You're awesome. Thank you.